Noah Basketball is our new presenting sponsor of our Coaching You podcast. Noah Basketball is a shot tracking and data company that has helped change how coaches and players perfect the game's most important skill, shooting. Noah is a data service provider that uses machine learning and the latest computer vision technology to provide real-time data and feedback to improve shooting accuracy and consistency for professional and amateur basketball players. Noah has now analyzed over 570 million shots from countless high school, hundreds of college teams, and 28 NBA franchises. The technology is simply amazing. Once the system has been installed, players will be able to get immediate feedback on their shooting arc, left and right positioning, depth, makes or misses, and makes the data available to players and coaches on your mobile device. For more information about how NOAA can help your team, visit noahbasketball.com. Welcome to another Coaching You podcast with the coach Brendan Sir, presented by Noah Basketball. Today, Chris Beard, c- coach of Old Miss. Absolutely, uh, I love Chris because he's a throwback. His mentor, the person that he respects the most in coaching, is Bob Knight, the late great Bob Knight, uh, who I also knew when I was a young kid coming up in high school, going to his camp. Uh, so Chris is a, as I like to say, he's an old soul. His fundamentals, he's about life. He's about culture. Uh, he's about the right things. And uh, I think you're really going to enjoy him. Uh, th- this is from our uh, Southeast Super Clinic that we had in early uh, June in Orlando. And it was absolutely spectacular. Uh, if you like this and you want all the other coaches of which all these final four coaches were there. Just great messages, great learning, so that you can grow this summer. Go to coachingyouplus.com, and I think you'll really be able to download all of these things that you really enjoy. So after our listening to our sponsors, uh, we'll be back with Chris Beer. We're thrilled to have our longtime partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball on board as sponsors of the Coaching You podcast. Dr. Dish machines are undoubtedly the most user-friendly and advanced machines in the world of basketball today. Dr. Dish has completely revolutionized and reimagined a shooting machine to provide the best solution on the market. Join top programs around the world like Duke, North Carolina, Florida, and countless others and upgrade your shooting machine to Dr. Dish. Dr. Dish machines are the best way to increase purposeful reps in your program to get players better, faster, while tracking progress along the way. Dr. Dish provides so much more than just your standard shooting machines with custom training, pro trainers, and coaches on demand, real-time and detailed analytics, and top-of-the-line drills and workouts. If you're looking to take your program to the next level, look no further than Dr. Dish for the best basketball training machine in the world. If you have an old machine that's just collecting dust in your gym, did you know that you can trade that in for to Dr. Dish for up to $1,500 off and get a new dish? Make sure to give our friends at Dr. Dish a follow at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter and Instagram for great daily drills, workouts, tips, and inspiration. Or contact us at drdishbasketball.com. Don't forget to mention Coaching You or our podcast for $300 off your purchase. Coaches, are you looking to take your game preparation to the next level? Then Fast Model Sports is the perfect coaching software for you. With FastDraw, build an organized library of plays and drills and create professional playbooks to share with your players and staff. You can also download over 9,500 free plays and drills from our play bank directly to your FastDraw account. Looking for a better way to build your scouting reports and want to include video? 
With Fast Scout, build custom scouting report templates to prepare your team best for each individual opponent. Plus, did you know with the latest updates from Fast Model Sports, you can now include video with your Fast Scout reports and share with your coaches and staff all within the Fast Scout mobile app. The combination of Fast Draw and Fast Scout is by far the best way for you and your coaches to create winning game strategies and effectively communicate them to your team. Over 10,000 high school and youth coaches trust Fast Model Sports products to help their teams reach their goals. To order, go to FastModelSports.com. Use code COACHINGU15 to get 15% off any Fast Draw or Fast Scout products. Remember, Go to FastModelSports.com, use code COACHINGU15 to get 15% off any Fast Draw and Fast Scout products. This is a good time of year, talking about basketball. We, uh, we had our first, our second team practice today. The NCAA gives us eight weeks in the summer. And so we normally go three days a week for eight weeks. So it ends up being around 20 practices is all, because we have some inner squads in there. So today was, uh, today was number two, so... It's that kind of year where you're starting to think about setting up your team and on the court, the X's and O's, and off the court, getting your guys together, culture, buzzword, everybody talks about these days. So it's really nice to be with you all this evening. A lot of respect uh, for anybody that's, that comes to clinics. One thing that we tell our players really on a weekly basis, there's probably not a week that goes by that we don't mention this at least one time. It's kind of one of our pillars, non-negotiables. I think as coaches, we all have a certain amount of things that are sacred to us. Um, this is one of them to us. We tell the players, I think the most important thing any of us have is time. Try to get the guys to understand that one day, if you're on the ninth inning of life, you're not going to be worried about another basket, another win, certainly not another dollar. But I think what we'll all strive for is just a little bit more time. Um, kind of like when you get to the end of your career, whether it's you're a high school player that's not going to play in college, or a college guy that's not going to play pro, or maybe you're blessed enough to be a pro that your body's going to dictate your final game. But all of us know on that deal, man, you just wish you had one more game, one more practice, one more bus trip. So time is everything. So try to get the players to understand the best gift you can give somebody or the best sign of respect you can show somebody is where you put your time. We all get 24 hours in a day. We try to encourage our players to sleep somewhere between eight and 10 hours a day. That's combining naps and stuff too. Recovery is what we talk it. So at the end of the day, you know, you got 16 or, or 14 hours a day and where you put that time is who you are. And so for you guys to come here tonight to try to better yourself, better your craft, basketball, it's like kind of humbling to me. Uh, but it's also a sign of respect. So a lot of, a lot of appreciation, a lot of respect for you to spend your time. Here's my thing on clinics. Like, I grew up coming to clinics. Like, one thing about me, I guess it's unique than maybe some other guys that coach in our game, is I've coached at all different levels. I've coached at NAI, Division II, junior college. I was at one college where it was a transition from D3 to D2, so I coached under D3 rules at some point. I've coached low major Division I basketball, high major basketball. You know, we coached on Monday night. One of our teams played for the national championship. Um, We've taken four different programs to NCAA tournaments. So I've also coached some professional experience. Um, one year I coached basically in the NBA G League. And then another year I had a chance to go to Europe for the summer and coach in Eurobasket. So I don't say that in like an arrogant way, but I say that in an absolute way. I think sometimes when you're listening to somebody speak at a clinic, you say, well, that guy never coached at my level. He never understands. Um, so I feel like one thing that's been special about my journey that God's blessed me with is an opportunity to coach at all different levels. So maybe everything tonight doesn't parallel to your team or your level directly, but chances are there's some type of, uh, of connection to it. So um, the thing I think, you know, we live in this, this, this world like where you can get information that you used to couldn't get. Like when I first started going to clinics, it's because I couldn't get the information any other way. And when I first started buying the VH tape, tapes and stuff, like it was just because I couldn't get the information any other way. But now we all live in this world where you can literally like just Google something. You want to know about the Miami Heat's culture? Just Google Miami Heat culture. You want to know about the best out of bounds play running the NBA or college basketball last year? It's accessible. So people ask me all the time, like, what's the value in still coming to a clinic? I, I think it's the correspondence, the, the question and answer. 
So I'll just throw out some topics tonight, ask a question at any point, and I'll save some, some real time at the end to answer any questions you have. It could be an on-the-court question about basketball. It could be an off-the-court question about our culture and how we set up teams uh, and things like that. So, again, these are the things that we're doing right now because we just had our second day this afternoon uh, and actually wrote some of these things down on the plane coming down here. And maybe this will uh, help you. You know, I was blessed to work with Bob Knight for eight years, and I had about a 12-year uh, relationship with him where we talked every day. But certainly those eight years with Coach Knight, it was like getting a Ph.D. in coaching every day, not only in practice or game time, but just all the time we had in the car recruiting or just, just spending time with Coach in eight years. And, um, you know, Coach was a big believer in sharing the game of basketball. Uh, he's one of the very first guys that wrote books about basketball, Let's Play Defense and Motion Offense. You still find these today in, like, archaic bookstores and stuff. He's also one of the first guys in our, in our game that would do clinics and stuff and share information. Other side of the coin, there's these coaches that still exist today that I, I respectfully disagree with that, you know, feel like they got some secrets or they don't want to tell people what they do. I understand that from a competitive standpoint. Maybe you don't want to tell everybody your secrets, but on the other side, I think the game is bigger than all of us. So with that being said, we've always, you know, kind of honored Coach Knight in that way that our program is kind of an open book. Invitation to any of you, if you ever wanted to come spend time with us in Oxford, Mississippi, whether it's for practice or game, our practices are always open to coaches. Our film room is always open to coaches. So something Coach Knight believed in, and we've tried to, uh, to honor that. So this is one that Coach would talk about all the time. It's still true today. We told our staff this morning, our staff meeting, but it sounds real simple. But when you think about it, I don't think there's any greater compass to trying to win in a team sport is we tell our guys all the time, hey, let's keep the main thing the main thing. Um, it's like, you know, Today's practice, we're trying to really be a better rebounding team this year. We were not a very good rebounding team our first year in the SEC. It's a focus. We talk about it with our players. We've implemented film room. So in practice, even though we have all these objectives going on, of course we want to take care of the ball. Of course we want to work on our transition defense. Of course we want to work on work our pick and roll defense. We're just constantly going back to keep the main thing the main thing. So from a basketball standpoint, it kind of speaks for itself. Also from a program standpoint, you know, we try to keep the main thing the main thing. For us, we believe that's the players. We have 16 players on this year's team, 13 scholarship guys, three walk-ons. Like, we keep the main thing the main thing. And I try to explain to all, every staff member, whether it's our trainer, or strength coach, or GAs, player development, every time I meet with these guys individually on our staff, I just ask them, hey, we're keeping the main thing the main thing. Because you can get caught up in, in coaching and in life and stuff, and you can have a really productive day sitting at that computer, or you can have a really productive day you know, this, but, you know, did you touch the players? Was the main thing the main thing? So we're constantly thinking about every day in our program, did we impact the players? Keep the main thing the main thing. All the way down to basketball. You know, in my opinion, in basketball, there's five things that get you beat, and there's also five things that can help you win. Three are on the defensive side. You got to get back. Call it transition defense. Call it conversion defense, as Coach called it. Call it getting back, as we, we use that word a lot. But you got to get back. You can play the game in a perfect way. You can have a championship program, but that one thing that can get you beat on any given night is not getting back. On the flip side, a more positive view would be if you had the best transition defense in your league, you've got a pathway to a championship. Um, you know, the teams that don't give up easy baskets have a chance to win. So first thing that can get you beat or can help you win every game on your schedule is transition defense. The other bookend of defense, we call it bookend. We have something in our program. We literally have two books. One is transition defense. And then one is rebounding. And everything in between these bookends is you building your defense, you know, based on who you're playing, your philosophy, the, the competition you have to play against. One, you know, one year, for example, something in between those bookends might be shot blocking because you might be blessed to have some length and some athleticism and some shot blocking. Other years you might not have that. It might be taking charges. But what's in between those bookends is going to change year to year, I think, based on your talent. But those bookends never change. So one bookend, getting back, transition defense. That next book, that last bookend is rebounding. Explain to the players almost on a weekly basis, the most important thing to me in defense is rebounding. It doesn't matter how good your defense is. If you can't end the possession by getting the ball, that's not a stop. Kind of goes the other way, too. We've had some uh, you know, teams over the years that really weren't great defensive teams, but statistically, we ended up being a top five defense in the country because we, we, we controlled the backboards. It doesn't really matter how weak your defense is. If you can 
limit the opponent to one shot per possession at the end of the game, at the end of the week, at the end of the season, you're going to have a pretty good statistical defense. So those two bookends. The third thing, in my opinion, that can get you beat that's also on the defensive side of the ball is fouling. And this is the thing that I don't think gets talked about enough. And as a matter of fact, I first kind of got my attention brought to this being in the clinic just like this. I was at a clinic in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, listening to Lute Olson, Hall of Fame uh, Arizona coach, and his assistant, Jay John, was talking about it. But I think this is the thing that um, you know, could really challenge some of you guys, maybe a, a thought that gets you thinking a little bit, because ultimately that's what comes from a clinic, right? You're not going to take my offense or defense. You're not going to take our culture, but maybe one thing. Um, you always know if you had a really good clinic experience, because if you and I run into an airport together 10 years from now, and you can remember just one thing that we talked about that you implemented, implemented to me, that's a successful clinic. Um, but Arizona was the best with Coach Olson with not fouling. I know when I first started coaching, I was all about, like all of us, I wanted aggressive, I wanted hard play. I almost valued the foul in practice because we were going hard. But if you really think about our game, the 40-minute game, the 32-minute game, and you think about it, fouling absolutely gets you beat. The last four minutes of any close game comes down to three or four things. Fouling is by far the number one factor, period. If your team on offense can get fouled and get to the free throw line, the huge advantage, like pathway to a victory in the last four minutes of the game is shooting more free throws than your opponent. On the flip side, you think about it, more championship games, more close games come down to fouls in the last four minutes. So we spend a lot of time with our team drilling it and talking about it. You know, simple things like making sure that your players understand when the other team's in a bonus and when they're not. Because your defense can obviously adjust. You know, you still have fouls to give. You can play defensively a little bit different. You don't have fouls to give. To me, you have to play a different kind of defense. Um, one thing that we do is we have something called yellow. When we are in yellow, we are non-negotiably not fouling. The only foul we will tolerate or allow in yellow is a foul that basically uh, keeps the other team from scoring a basket. And when we're in that, we just never want to have and ones when we're in yellow. So this is something we would do in games. If you ever watch us play or see us play, you'll kind of tell when we're in our yellow defense. Uh, it's also something we do in practice. Um, for example, almost every single day we play four on four. So today we had four teams of four. It was four on four on four on four. Most teams, most days it's just four on four on four. We're blessed to have 12 healthy players most days. We uh, sometimes play this by the clock, sometimes just play, play this by the scoreboard. Today was four on four, and we were playing to eight points, twos and threes, and plus ones for offensive rebounds. But some games we say, hey man, today we're in yellow. This whole four on four, every team is in yellow, or white team, you're in yellow. And we'll basically, you know, a dumb foul, an undisciplined foul will be four, t four points for the other team. Um, but the five things that can get you beat, number three defensively, I believe, is fouling. And I don't think as coaches, we talk about it enough. It literally comes down to winning a championship or finishing second. It literally comes down to a coach keeping his job at some points. It's like, it's like the one thing we don't talk about enough. We all want aggressive players. We all want to feel like our teams are playing hard. But I think the ability to talk about not fouling is really important. We want to be a team that you know, doesn't let the other team get to the bonus. From time to time, we'll have a first half where the first half ends and the other team's not in a bonus. That's a huge thing for us because we're going to get that stop at the end of the first half because we have three fouls to give. And certainly late in the game when the other team is not in the bonus or maybe at least still in the one-on-one, -on -one, it's just a huge advantage for your defense. So we spend a lot of time talking about that. To me, the five things get you beat. That's the third on the defensive end. On the offensive end of the floor, um, you know, we, we can talk about the X's and O's and all, but I think... The, the main thing here in basketball, the two things that can get you beat, number one, is shot selection. You know, I don't, I don't think we talk about it enough, teach it enough, coach it enough, so shot selection. Uh, I, I see the game in a much individual way. You know, I, I think Matt Morrell has different shot selection than, than, you know, Jamie and Brakefield. So to me, it's not like this is a good shot for our team. It's more like this is a good shot for you. This is not a good shot for you. Coach Knight would talk a lot about, you know, like basketball is not a democracy. You know, we're not all out here. Just because you're on the team, you get to take the shot. So we really try to define each player's game shots. For some of our, our younger players or role players, um, you know, it might be just we got guys on our team, man, it's, it's, it's an open three-point shot. It's a shot fake and one dribble pull-up. Post players on our teams, even our team that played for the national championship, we had a post player that had one move. It was left shoulder, right hand jump hook. He had to have two feet in the paint to shoot it. 
but we try to get very specific with our players what their game shots are. We are constantly committed to our players improving, whether it's the off-season or even in-season player development. So your shot selection is today, it can change maybe tomorrow, next week or next year. So, but in terms of winning the game, we try to be very specific on each of our players' shot selections. One way I describe it to our players that might be able to help you communicate with your team um, is like this. I explain to the guys, we kind of make a big, a big deal about this presentation, but the guys will come out to practice one day, um, you know, maybe after we've practiced four or five days, two or three weeks to the season starts, and we'll actually line up the bench like it's game night. And we'll get the guys kind of feeling this. We'll put five players on the floor. We'll get everybody else in the organization sitting where they would be on game night. We go out there and we try to almost like throw the jump ball. So we get the guys' attention. We get them feeling what's, what's coming. You know, instead of just having a conversation, we get them feeling this conversation's a little bit different. And we just explain to the players that one of our objectives on November 4th will be to win the jump ball. And when we win the jump ball, we're going to come down and we're going to have our first possession of the season. And one of the five players on the court is going to be blessed enough to take that ball, our ball, everybody in the ball, everybody in the organization, you know, the organization's ball, and we're going to take that first shot of the season. And the goal is for when that first shot of the season happens that everybody on the bench, everybody in the organization is, is okay, is happy, is pleased with that shot. That's a good shot for our team. And that will go all the way down to the individual player, you know. Uh, Matt Morrell gets an open three. That's a shot that everybody in the organization believes in. We believe in it because of a mathematical component. We know that in the summer, Matt shot 300 made threes a day, and he shot 80% from the three-point line with no defense. We know that this, through six weeks of practice, Matt shot over 40% from the three-point line in practice. This is the things you have to do to be a green light shooter for us. So the point is, it's not just because Matt's a good player, or I like Matt, or you like Matt. It's because Matt earned the right through work, through stat sheet, through hours, through communication, and everybody in our organization agrees that that's a good shot. And just try to explain to the players that on the bench, we're all sitting there, we're okay with Matt making that shot, taking that shot. So that's shot selection, the individual side. And I think championship teams, everybody understands everybody else. It's not just about Keenan understanding his shot selection, it's about him understanding and embracing what Zach's shot selection is too. And I think the more you can put it out there, the better. I think any coach that's having a closed door meeting with a player, about that player's shot selection, then that's not a transparent locker room. You're trying to finish second. So we talk about shot selection individually, but everybody is a part of that process. So the fourth thing I think can get you beat in basketball is taking bad shots. Uh, fifth and final, it's turnovers. And this is where we've had a lot of success, uh, getting, again, four teams in the NCAA tournament, a couple of lead eights. We played on Monday night. Uh, we've always taken a lot of pride in being one of the best ball security teams in the country. We start our journey early on explaining to our players that we want to be a team that has 10 turnovers or less. And we tell our team we want to be a team by the time late February and March turns around, we want to try to have about eight turnovers or less. We don't believe you can win six games in three weekends in, in an NCAA tournament at, at, at our level uh, by having anywhere more than around eight, nine turnovers a game in, in at least some of those six games that you have to win. So it starts with a big goal in mind. We, we constantly remind our players, too, that the goal is not zero turnovers. There's going to be what we call a basketball turnover from time to time. An aggressive play didn't go our way. The official missed the call. You know, a freaky thing happened. A good player missed, missed the catch. So it's never about zero or less. It's about that 10 or less, and we're giving ourselves room for error, um, knowing that some of them, these are going to be basketball turnovers. When we get down to the last four minutes of the game, trying to win a championship, now the standard's pretty strong. We... We have to play this last four minutes of the game with no turnovers. If we have one, we have to make up for it with something great. On defense, we have something we call the MIG, M-I-G, most important guy. We keep track of the MIGs in practice. We keep track of the MIGs during games, most important guy. This is an individual player just making a play. This could be a block shot or a wall up or a deflection or a vertical jump. This could be a switch out of necessity. This could be a steal. This is just when an individual player makes an extraordinary kind of individual effort. Back to the turnover game, if we're going to absorb a turnover in the last four minutes of the game, then we're going to have to have something that counters that. One example of something we could have would be a defensive MIG, M-I-G, most important guy. So back to keeping the main thing the main thing, it's we're constantly talking about these five things. Every day before practice, we talk about this as a staff. Every team meeting, we talk about these things. Really, all of our game prep at our level 
It doesn't come down to some fancy scouting report. It comes down to us figuring out how can we control these five things in this game. Transition defense, what's our plan? Rebounding, what's our plan? Not fouling, what's our plan? And on offense, how can we take care of the ball, right? And how can we get great shots? And so keeping the main thing, the main thing, kind of the broad, the broad view from a basketball standpoint, those are the five things that we, we believe in from a basketball standpoint. I'll mention a couple things about our culture, um, and then again, I'd like to just answer any questions you have. I think that's the benefit of clinics. You know, you can't ask YouTube that question, um, but you can ask human beings that question. So in no particular order of importance or anything, but just a couple things that I think could maybe impact y'all's teams, and ultimately that's what I'd love to do today. I'd love to help you uh, win a game next year that maybe you wouldn't, wouldn't if you weren't at this clinic. But um, we have some what we call non-negotiables kind of pillars of our culture. And I think one of the advantages today, all the access and information we can get, it can almost become overload. It's like if you're on Twitter, one of these things, and you get the great basketball information, at some point it's just like, man, I'm following too many people. I've got too many things coming at me. Um, so we just try to get this down to non-negotiables and our pillars. Man, we like all the other ideas, and from time to time somebody might uh, motivate us to the point where we make a change. But these are things that we believe in. We would rather be great at these than good at a lot of things. Again, keep the main thing the main thing. We don't have 25 things that we believe in our culture. We have eight or nine, and we try to execute them on a daily basis. One thing we try to talk about is respectful communication. You know, we know that a lot of our games this year uh, are going to come down to a 30-second timeout with your team, the ability to communicate. Um, Communication is everything, uh, whether it be eye contact and a personal conversation. One thing we're implementing this year on this year's team for the first time is with our team techs, when a player communicates with another player, or a staff member to player, anybody within our organization communicates, we're not allowing the thumbs up. So I send you a text and you just thumbs up or you heart it, we're, we're not allowing that. There has to be words coming out of your mouth on text. Okay, got it. Yes, sir. Bet. Good idea. I'll be there. Right? Coach, I was there. So we're not allowing the thumbs up. I think this thing is like it's, you can't even tell if you're communicating or not because everybody just thumbs up. So that's one specific example that might help some of you guys today. Another thing we really believe in is turning these cell phones off from time to time. In my European basketball experience, I'm not good in years. Things are on 2014 or 15. I was blessed enough to be um, the, coach of the assistant coach on the Swiss national team. We are in Eurobasket. Um, we had three NBA players in our team. Capello, who's still an NBA player today, Cephalosius, and a guy named Greg Bruner, one of the all-time great Big Ten players. So I was in Europe for eight weeks coaching really good players. I um, don't know if you know much about international basketball, but basically you've got the NBA Finals that we're all enjoying right now. You've got the Olympics as Americans that we all love. Then you've also got you know, the EuroLeague Championship that for most of the world is more important than the NBA Finals. And then you have Eurobasket, which is basically teams in Europe playing for a European championship. So I was blessed to coach a really good team at that level. European basketball was awesome to me, being a college, kind of American-type coach. The tradition, the stuff in their culture, it was just, it was awesome. So, uh, for example, the first team meeting we had, the first team meal we had, we got there early. All the players had the same polo on. They had to dress the same shirt only. The players enter the room at the same time. Uh, the captains first. So a lot, of, a lot of tradition, a lot of stuff that we brought back to our programs in college. But I'll never forget the first night I was at a team meeting with the Swiss national team, or team mill, excuse me. The players were on one long table um, where everybody could see each other uh, eye to eye. So there's no place to sit at the table where you couldn't see a teammate eye to eye, right? I think it's, we sometimes go eat and we're at teams of three or four. To me, you can't have a team meeting unless everybody can see each other eye to eye. It's one of the things we believe in our culture, eye to eye. Um, the coaches, we were sitting at another table, it was four of us. Uh, I got to that mill, and these are grown men. I mean, you know, we had 30-year-old NBA players, pros, had some young guys. Um, there was an energy in that room at that mill that it took me a while to kind of grasp what was going on. It felt different. It was like, it felt good. There was positive. There was an energy in the room. There was communication in it. And it took me a while to kind of figure it out. And then once I realized what it was, you know, we've never gone back with our program. But with the Swiss national team, Peter, the head coach, he did not allow cell phones at Mills. 
And when we got to that mill that day, it was the first time in four or five years, you know, as a college coach, and I'm literally watching guys sit there and eat dinner together, and there's no cell phones, and the communication was off the charts. It reminded me when I was a player and we didn't have cell phones, those bus rides, those team meetings, those locker rooms, those, those, those Friday nights with my teammates and stuff, right? But I think the cell phone and technology, we can debate all day, good, bad, there's probably both, right? But there's no doubt about it. I don't believe the players communicate today because of cell phones. I'm not so sure some of our coaches on our staff can communicate without their cell phone. So one thing we do in our culture, real talk, maybe this will help you is, we have times in our program where we, we don't have cell phones. We have what we call the golden bucket. We got this huge bucket. It was back when I was in Division II and didn't have a budget and actually found it from the janitor at Angelo State. It was just a bucket, landscaping bucket. So we also really believe in tradition and uh, so we, we still have it today at Ole Miss. We have a bucket, we paint it gold, it's the golden bucket. We come into a team meal, everybody, including coaches, including myself, you turn your phone off, you put it in the bucket, we all go in to eat. Other times we would have a cell phone bucket. It's maybe we're doing a community service project or maybe we're going bowling. As I heard Coach Keats mention, top golf or whatever. But from time to time, we're going to pull out the golden bucket. We're all going to put our cell phones in and we're going to communicate. You realize you're coaching players that can't talk, right? You're realizing you're coaching players that can't have a conversation because their whole lives are like this. Well, back to basketball, right? That's why we're here tonight. We can't have cell phones out here playing basketball. I can't text you in the corner to watch the back cut. We can't have a timeout or we can't have a halftime where everybody pulls out their phones and we're communicating. So, you know, this game of basketball that we all love, we still have to talk and communicate. So the no cell phone policy from Mills from time to time, the cell phone bucket, the communication, I want to share that with you guys today. Communication is a big part of our culture. Uh, you know, we believe in it. Another thing I think is, um, you know, I got this from Bill Walsh, uh, Hall of Fame 49ers football coach, reading his books and stuff. Um, again, I'm a product of clinics. A lot of respect for you being here tonight. Obviously, there's different ways to win a championship. One year, you might win it through the post. The next year, you might win it through great guard play. Maybe it's a defensive team, it's an offensive team, but the style of play is going to change. So when you start looking at characteristics, if you want to compare the last five championship teams in your league, it's not probably going to be style of play. Players change, coaches playing. But I think when you really start studying championship teams, there's one thing that I think is a non-negotiable. There's one thing I think is an absolute. I don't think you can win a championship with a negative culture. I know you can't. I don't think you can. You might win some games along the way, but you're not going to be the winner. There's only one winner, the winner. For our sport, Monday night, about 10.30 p.m. when you get the trophy. And so I think we start studying that, like, I believe that all championship teams have a positive culture. Doesn't mean you don't have tough days, tough conversations, bad moments, but all things considered, you have a positive culture. To me, the foundation of that is I've studied this and really believe this, man, is I think there's one way to be positive, and that's to be thankful, period. We all have adversity in our lives, period. There's not one person here tonight that's not going through something. I lost my dad recently, my mom's in bad shape. I've had a, obviously a tough year and a half or so. I've had some adversity, we've all had it. But there's still gotta be a way to be positive. The idea to be positive is not that just everything's perfect because everything's not perfect. Just like in a basketball game, you're gonna have adversity. You're gonna have a turnover, you're gonna have a bad shot, you have a bad call from the referees. So back to if we want this positive culture, then how are we gonna get it? To me, we're gonna get it by having a thankfulness in our program. 